Five Nights at Freddy's is one of the most iconic horror games of all time. I'm gonna be honest though, I've hardly played any games in this genre. Unless you count Slenderman or those Roblox horror games, I've always been the kid who avoided scary things. I hadn't seen nearly all of those classic horror movies, and my favorite Halloween costume was Super Mario. It's not like I was completely against spooky stuff or anything. I mean, I still remember loving creepypastas like Ben Drowned or Sonic.exe. In fact, one of my favorite YouTube series was some ordinary gamers haunted gaming, but when it came to playing creepy games myself, I couldn't bear to do it. That was until Five Nights at Freddy's came around. August 12th, 2014, nearly a decade ago, I was browsing my YouTube homepage as usual when I stumbled upon a Markiplier video titled Warning, scariest game in years. I didn't even like scary games, but for some reason I clicked. And to be honest, what I saw didn't really impress me that much. Sure, the sight of Foxy running down the halls was perhaps one of the scariest things I'd ever seen, but I didn't care much. Despite my negative reaction, for the next two months I would see FNAF completely take over YouTube. It had even become a meme of how people would overreact to getting jump scared even though it wasn't that scary. Then one day, I would witness a man's life change forever. At the time, MatPat's game theory was already an established channel, one that would have likely been successful no matter what games he covered. Then came October 23rd, 2014, where he released the one video that took him from being a YouTube star to a household name for gamers. Five Nights at Freddy's Scariest Monster is You. This video raked in over 32 million views and was the first to use the thumbnail format that game theory still uses to this day. While the video itself was just a compilation of popular theories about the game, the intro is what truly made the video shine. At the time, many YouTubers were copying the recent success of Markiplier's FNAF series. It seemed like everybody's videos consisted of them throwing themselves around like fish whenever they got jump scared. Matt Pat made light of this in his own video, making fun of those copying Markiplier and everyone else doing FNAF videos at the time. At the end of the day, this video is what brought me and millions of others into the FNAF series. Suddenly, the gameplay didn't really matter anymore. We just wanted to learn the true nature of this story. Now, before we delve into the many stories that can be told about the game, I should probably address why this video is just covering the first two FNAF games. This may be a selfish reason, but I believe there was a certain magic about these two games that wasn't captured past FNAF 3. Now, I'm not saying that these games weren't great in their own right, in fact, I'd say they handled the lore aspect of the game amazingly, but I think there was something special about the times where we didn't know too much about the story, but still had enough to piece together our own lore, and perhaps a Akin to something like the Pokemon craze of the early 2000s, the FNAF community was on fire during late 2014 and early 2015. If you didn't play the games yourself, you probably had a friend who did, or at least watched the thousands of YouTube videos about the game. But while we know a lot about the game itself, we can't forget about the man who created it, Scott Cawthon. Now look, I know there's a vocal minority of people who are against some stuff he's done, and while I do keep politics out of my videos, feel free to voice your opinions in the comments below. But before he created Five Nights at Freddy's, Scott Cawthon was known for making some pretty bad games. Well, actually, he wasn't really known at all, but regardless, he used to make Christian and family-style games. The problem was, his art design skills were not very appealing to the eyes of children. In fact, after getting really harsh feedback from a popular review, Viewer, who basically called one of his games unintentionally terrifying, Scott went into a mini depression. But I'm sure as many have also experienced, these hard times would create the environment for innovation and inspiration. In a big F you to the guy who called his game scary, Scott created a real horror game. One that would be discussed on the Mount Rushmore of horror games. One that would popularize an entire genre of game on the internet. And one that would make him a very, very wealthy man. Five Nights at Freddy's. When you boot up the game, you're greeted by a very simple menu. New game, continue, and Freddy himself. The mechanics of the game are simple. Check the security cameras, check the doors, and wait patiently until 6am strikes. And for the first night, it really is that easy. Unfortunately, as many have experienced, this game is a little harder than it leads on. See, you'll eventually learn that certain animatronics move differently than others. Each of these guys take their own unique path to end your game. Freddy and Chica come from the right, Bonnie and Foxy come from the left. The methods they take to actually 
actually get in your room though are all different. Bonnie is the most aggressive and unpredictable animatronic, but still is quite easy to manage if you know what you're doing. Chica, on the other hand, is quite passive, taking a slow and predictable approach to your office. Foxy is unique in the sense that he doesn't move unless he is attacking you. Basically, the more you ignore the cameras, the faster he will attack you. Freddy is both the most dangerous and the most predictable animatronic of them all, because Freddy follows the same path every time and ends up right next to your office in a tricky spot you might forget about. Once he's there, you'll have to remember not to look at any other camera besides his with the door open, or else it's game over. There also is Golden Freddy, but he's more of a lore-based character and isn't a common problem you'll have to deal with. Now this was all super simplified for the sake of brevity, but do keep in mind that this game is quite complicated at higher difficulties. While there is a certain formula that can nearly guarantee victory, pulling it off perfectly is one of the most difficult challenges in horror gaming. There was a time where YouTubers were competing for the title King of Five Nights at Freddy's, awarded to whoever could complete 420 mode, essentially max difficulty. In general though, the gameplay of FNAF isn't very hard until the last few nights. The star of the show is the phone guy and the several calls he makes to you throughout the game. Upon starting the first night, you receive an unusual phone call informing you of the situation you're in. You basically learn that the animatronics might move around and even come into your office. In the last few words of the call, he tells you everything you have at your disposal to defend these attacks. While brief, this call helps you understand that power is limited, but necessary in order to defend against the animatronics. It also introduces your only companion throughout this horror game while also taking that companion away after a few minutes, leaving you in silence for the rest of your first night. Nights 2 and 3 begin with another call, but this time much shorter and less filled with lore. The purpose of this is to emphasize that these nights get progressively harder and harder. Night 4 is your last night with the phone guy as his message is much more panicked and you can hear banging at his door. You can assume he was killed. This is furthered even more when in night 5, you just hear static and presumably an animatronic talking. With each call, you can hear the anxiety of phone guy increase, much like yours will as the animatronics become more aggressive. I firmly believe that without these calls, Five Nights at Freddy's would have never gotten as much attention as it did. The amount of lore that can be unpacked in the first call and throughout the establishment allowed the internet to go wild with the theories. Why did these animatronics attack you? Who are we playing as? While these questions would elude us for many years, our next step towards answers was Five Nights at Freddy's 2. Somehow, Scott was able to create FNAF 2 in three short months right after the release of FNAF 1. Perhaps this urgency is what helped push these games to superstardom, but regardless, everyone was just happy to have gotten a sequel to the first game so soon. Or well, I should probably say prequel. Now would be a good time to mention the Scott Games website, which had been teasing FNAF 2 shortly after the release of the original. At first, it was just an image of Freddy in a new high quality render, simply confirming a sequel. Then, people started checking the website again, and a new image appeared this time displaying text and images teasing that there would be both new and old animatronics. The next image basically confirmed this when we saw Foxy and Mangle together. Next was the first teaser of gameplay, showing the Freddy mask being used and also teasing the fact that there would be no doors. A lot of people thought this would be like a death scene since you're inside of a Freddy head, which honestly makes a lot of sense. The final teaser was seemingly just a black screen, but when it was brightened up, it showed the brand new marionette. People really tried piecing together a lot from these trailers even though they were just so surface level, but that became the fun of waiting for the next FNAF game. A series of teasers would eventually become a common trope for Scott while developing every game, and at the time, this was a unique approach to teasers that usually always got people theorizing. When the game was finally released, all of the prequel theories were proven right. The most obvious of answers was the fact that the phone guy was back. There was some conflicting evidence since the old animatronics were back and in a withered state, but these were different than FNAF 1's. Putting this game before FNAF 1 but after FNAF 4. The gameplay of FNAF 2 is often its most praised and yet most criticized aspect. It takes the original formula and turns it completely upside down, removing doors from your office. Instead, you are given a Freddy mask and lights. The Freddy mask can stop all animatronics except for two, Foxy and the puppet. This change was mind-blowing at the time, and it added a whole new layer of fear into a game that was already creepy. That being said, this game had introduced a whole new lineup of animatronics, and while the withered ones were pretty much just like the original designs, there were new toy animatronics introduced as well. There are only three toy animatronics though, because Toy Foxy was turned into Mangle. 
There also are a few side characters that can mess with your night, being Golden Freddy, Balloon Boy, and the Puppet. Honestly, I'm not going to bother explaining all of these animatronics, but I will talk about some of the important ones. A general thing that should be known though is that animatronics can come from three separate places. The left vent, the right vent, and the hallway. The only animatronics that cannot be tracked are the Puppet, who will insta-kill you if you don't wind the music box, and Golden Freddy, who will kill you if you don't put on the mask when he appears in your office, or if you flash him with your light too long in the hallway. Balloon Boy is unique in that he doesn't actually end your game ever, instead, when he enters your room, he turns off your flashlight, basically leaving you a sitting duck for Foxy to kill you. I was always a big fan of these new animatronics, and I was genuinely surprised to see such a cast after the small roster of FNAF 1. As for gameplay in general, people often say this game is one of the hardest in the series. At least, when the game came out, people were struggling. Specifically, the gameplay started getting really tough when Night 4 came around. With all of these animatronics active, players of the first game were clearly overwhelmed. Now for me, I played the mobile version of the game, which was actually quite a bit harder than the PC version. I'll be honest though, going back, I can beat this game with ease. This is simply because there's a near perfect formula to win at any difficulty. At the time though, many of us struggled and could only beat custom nights vicariously through our favorite YouTubers. In my opinion, this game on release was one of the most fun to play in the series. I just think over time, the difficulty started to wear off and now it just seems a little robotic. The gameplay in FNAF 2 was was only a small aspect of its charm though. FNAF 2's phone calls follow a similar style to 1 in the sense they basically tell you how to play the game while dropping some lore in there too. This time however, the information given to us is far deeper than in the first game. We learn about things like facial recognition and the animatronics, another restaurant we didn't even know about, and an employee who had been fired and banned from the building. At the time, these calls allowed for a ton of speculation, however this game was simply planting seeds for the games to come. Aside from the calls, we were given a series of mini games that detailed some of the main events of Five Nights at Freddy's, being the murders done by William Afton. While these were further explored in FNAF 3 and beyond, these mini games showed us that the FNAF lore was likely much, much deeper than we expected. Okay, now that we've been acquainted with these games again, let's delve into the culture of the time. How could I make a FNAF retrospective video without talking about the living Tombstone songs? When these dropped, it didn't matter what music was popular at the time, we were listening to FNAF songs. You know, I had forgotten about these for a while, but I stumbled upon an AI generated Frank Sinatra cover of a jazz cover of the first FNAF song. And let me tell you, if you haven't listened to it, you gotta. I just love how nostalgic I feel listening to this music. It's just hard to believe it's been almost a decade since they released. Of course, besides the music, you had a whole subculture of FNAF SFM videos that one of my best friends used to make when he was a kid. Can't forget to mention the thousands of fan games people made too, basically keeping the genre of survival horror alive for ages. Now I guess I should go back into the lore a bit, but but I do think that plenty of YouTubers have already done that justice. For the sake of the video and the memories, I'll just talk about the most interesting bits in FNAF 1 and 2. At the time, Golden Freddy was perhaps the most interesting subject to discuss because there were people who thought it was just an easter egg, but there was also another group who believed it was a genuine part of the lore. Of course, now we know who Golden Freddy really was, the souls of Evan Afton and Cassidy who seek revenge against the person who killed them. The fact that Golden Freddy was just able to crash your game and teleport through rooms was terrifying, especially if you were playing for the first time and didn't know he existed. I distinctly remember seeing Golden Freddy in the hallway of FNAF 2, keeping the flash in him too long, and getting jump scared. The Bite of 87 was also another huge theory that wouldn't be answered until… ever, I think. A lot of people thought it was the scene in FNAF 4, like Markiplier, but that was in 1983, so it wasn't that. I really remember people trying to make a case for every animatronic in the world being responsible for the bite, so it's a bit anticlimactic still not having an answer in game. In FNAF 2, there were also a plethora of new theories. Obviously the main one was the purple guy, who we now know as William Afton. A big one was also Shadow Bonnie and Shadow Freddy, which we never really got a solid answer for. The presence of the puppet also raised a lot of questions and theories, but most of those ended up being answered in the following games or just in the mini games themselves. Fortunately though, most of the theories that actually mattered were answered throughout the upcoming games or the books, and maybe even the movie too. While I'm sure some people would love to talk about this game for hours, I still want to have enough time to watch the new movie and make a video comparing that and the games. Regardless, these two FNAF games changed the course of gaming history, ushering in the era of mainstream indie games alongside Undertale. The results of FNAF's success inspired many across the world to make 
make their very own games, even if it was just one person doing it. Now, almost a decade later, we patiently await the release of a movie, taking us all back to that time when we were kids.